to uh, this program on the summer in Montgomery Voting Rights Morning. Uh, we are really fortunate to have uh, two people here who were there at a pivotal event in the uh, campaign for voting rights and in the enactment of the Voting Rights Act in 1965. Um, for those of you who don't know me, uh, I'm Jonathan Enton. I teach constitutional law and some other things around here. Um, Diane Phillips Leatherbury, uh, who's married to my colleague Bill Leatherbury, Marsh and Selma, uh, Dan Clancy, who is a graduate of the law school and was an FBI agent assigned to Selma at the time. Um, so they were, they were both there. Uh, I just want to take a, we didn't know each other then. I just want to take a minute uh, to provide a little, uh, very brief background, uh, and, uh, and then we'll, I'll turn it over to, to Diane and to Dan. Um, the events that we're going to be talking about took place in the early part of 1965. Uh, Alabama at that time was rigidly segregated, and that's true despite the Montgomery bus boycott and the Birmingham demonstrations of a few years earlier. Um, there were efforts to get African Americans registered to vote. Uh, a lot of that work was initially done by the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Uh, and then in early 1965, uh, Dr. King's uh, organization, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, also uh, came to uh, Selma, which is about 50 miles west of Montgomery. Uh, and one of the most segregated places in a very segregated state. Um, the sheriff there was a fellow named Jim Clark, uh, very violent, very short-tempered, um, and uh, made no bones about his position. Um, in the course of the demonstrations in and around Selma, uh, in February of 1965, in an adjoining community, a young man named Jimmy Lee Jackson, a, a young black man, uh, was, uh, was shot by, uh, by law enforcement uh, officials. Uh, in, in fact, I think one of the uh, people involved in that case uh, uh, was recently convicted uh, in that case years later. Jimmy Lee Jackson died several days later. Uh, and the original Selma March, which took place on March 7th, 1965, uh, was designed as a protest about his killing. Uh, and on that Sunday, um, the uh, SCLC organized some folks to, for this demonstration. Uh, they were going to march from Selma across the Edmund Pettus Bridge, which is uh, uh, goes over the uh, Alabama River and head to Montgomery. Uh, when they got there, however, they discovered that Sheriff Clark and his people were, uh, were waiting. And here is what happened on that day. Okay. 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 Judgment at Nuremberg, a film about Nazi war crimes. 
the reason we say that the, uh, the idea of the march sort of happened there was that Reverend James Bevel, who worked for us for the <coughs> Southern Christian Leadership Conference, but who also had <coughs> close contact with, with SNCC, he, he, he was preaching and he apparently had just read, for some reason, the book of Esther. And he, he, he decided that if Esther could go to the king to help the Jews, then blacks from Selma and Mary and, and the area should walk to Montgomery and get Governor Wallace to shape up. So I think, I, as a Jew, I think that's really interesting. In Dallas County, in which Selma is located, there formed in the 30s, 1930s, before even I was born, the da and even before Dean was born, <coughs> Um, no, no, not before Dan was born. Yeah, before Dan. <laughs> <laughs> You're older than I. Okay, maybe one year. Okay. <laughs> anyway, there was formed in there the Dallas Voters League in the 30s. And one of the founders was Amelia Plath Boynton, whom we'll hear about later. Now, on page 252, I have here in the eyes on the prize. Some quotes from some people. When it was clear that Dr. King was coming, reporters came. There were, there were reporters there a lot, actually, and um, so, because the Student Nonviolent and Coordinating Committee had been working in Dallas County in Selma in 1963. So they'd been having meetings and SNCC, SNCC was committed not just to lead people places, but to develop leadership and grassroots, grassroots people <coughs> to be able to vote. Um, but because Dr. King was coming, reporters came and they asked Sheriff Clark why, so, why, 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 don't feel, why there were so few blacks registered. And Sheriff Clark said, largely because of their mental IQ. Judge Hare, on the other hand, the man who had enjoined more than three blacks at a time from gathering publicly, meaning when, when SNCC escorted folks to sit in line to get into the registrar's office, um, they weren't allowed to do that. The judge said it was illegal. He said, you see, most of, our, uh, most of your Selma Negroes are descended from the Igbo and Angola tribes of Africa. You could never teach or trust an Igbo black in slave days. Back in slave days, excuse me. And even, I would, you wouldn't have said that. Back in slave days. And even today, I can spot their tribal characteristics. For instance, they have protruding heels. So those are two, two of the people who had power in Dallas County and that's what they said. <coughs> okay, what am I doing here? King came the first time after, um, in January, January 2nd of 1965, and spoke at the Browns Chapel African American Episcopal Church. Um, One, one of the things that folks were told when they went to these little meetings that SNCC had, and later, of what voting might, they were, they were, it was suggested what voting might lead to, and one of the things that could happen with the streets and the Negro, Negro part of town could be they'd get them paid, they actually could get their garbage picked up if enough people voted, and, listen to this, they could probably force the school board to allocate more money to their schools, which were open at that time for three hours a day. Okay, I want you to know that. So potential voters did go periodically to the to register to vote at the county courthouse. Only the registrars were only open like two days a, a month, and the registrars always came very late, took long lunch hours, and left early. And if you got in to see them, there was this literacy test. Which, and before you even got the literacy test, you had to fill out a four-page form, if you were black. Okay. About me now, again, back to me. 
I was at a party at the house of a black man on whose city council campaign I was working. And I learned that the next morning there was a charter plane going from Cincinnati to Selma, and there was one seat left, so I grabbed it. I stayed at the party as long as I could. I was living with my parents at the time. And both of them were asleep when I got home. And when I got up very early in the morning to go catch the plane, my mother came in. And the only question she asked me, which I learned was sort of an interesting parenthood, was how many engines the plane was going to have. She didn't mention that I might be going into danger. She wanted to know how many engines the plane was going to have. And I assured her that I would look before I got on it. I didn't assure her if it only had one, I wouldn't get on it. But I did assure her that I would look. Um, so, How many engines did the plane have? I believe it had two. <laughs> <laughs> two little tiny ones, you know, with propellers. That was a long time ago, wasn't it? So, um, it was a very small plane. On the plane, among other people, were Terry Embry, wife of Wayne Embry, and Yvonne Robertson, wife of Oscar Robertson. Now, if you know your basketball history at all, NBA history specifically, you know who Oscar Robertson and Wayne Embry was, were, are, they still are, excuse me. <laughs> and at one point, um, Wayne Embry was general manager of the Cavaliers. Um, so I learned much later that Wayne and Oscar had wanted to go to Selma, and the Cincinnati Royals, for which they played at the time, said no. And probably the no uh, made a lot of sense since both guys were pretty tall and would have been wonderful targets um, to, to violence if they were there. Um, a reform rabbi from a different temple to the one that I belong to and taught at was the last guy on and he sat in the co-pilot seat. He lifted his Bible and quoted the title of a very popular book at the, at the time, which is God is My Co-Pilot. So that was kind of funny. If you didn't think maybe we re really needed a co-pilot that might be able to fly the plane, but... <laughs> <laughs> that didn't really bother me until I observed from my seat that the rabbi and the pilot were reading a map together, <laughs> looking for the Selma airport. That, that was a sort of an interesting reaction, uh, you know, about what, what would happen if we landed at the wrong airport, then what would happen. So, but they found Selma and the Selma airport on the map and we landed at the airport. Um, we gathered in front of the chapel, the Brown Chapel, and um, it was just a bunch of, a whole bunch of people gathering and then we finally lined up. And the, the rules in those days were women and children on the inside, and obviously men on the outside. And I want to observe to you now, there was technology involved in this, in this walk. Walkie-talkies. I don't know if you've been, ever seen a walkie-talkie or even heard of a walkie-talkie, but it's sort of a one-way radio. Back to a guy who has another one-way radio to say, yeah, no, whatever. That was the technology. So I'm just trying to set the stage for you. Other pieces of the technology was seeing those pictures on television. And we had never seen anything like that. Now they, they broadcast war live, but we've never seen a beating or anything like that on television. Okay. The times of fear, which are important to share because Dan's going to share his times of fear. Aren't you? Mm -hmm. Thanks. Okay. I'll stop soon. Where the, when we got to the apex of the bridge, because all of us had the mental pictures of the television set, and um, it, was, it was just kind of scary to get there, although there weren't any troops down below. We were being guarded by the nationalized National Guard but they were still the Alabama National Guard and they had their Confederate flag on their patches on their arms, which didn't make me feel particularly sick. Um, and then when the walk was over, and the first part of the walk was about 10 miles, and it's my understanding that there were between 2,500 and 3,000 people on that first part of that walk. Later, about 300 people kept walking till the outskirts of Montgomery. 
and they can't, and, and the staff of the SCLC and the SNCC had to find the farmers that, that owned their land and would let people camp there. They had to set up camps, bring food, toilets, for about 300 people for three days. Um, we had to be taken, we people from Cincinnati, all 12 to 14 of us, had to be taken to Montgomery because the Selma airport had no lights. It had no lights then, and maybe it doesn't have any lights now either. It may not even exist now. But So we, we were driven in, in the back of pickup trucks. And when lights came from either direction, we lied down on top of each other. We became a very intimate, friendly group because we didn't want them to see, obviously, that you know, the, it could have been the Klan coming, and it would be fun to, to uh, sabotage the truck or just take a few shots at us sitting up there proudly. So, we, so the pickup trucks were, the, the other pickup trucks on the route were, were scary. I don't know if there were any cars. Um, at the end of the week, I really wanted to be there to walk into Montgomery. That doesn't surprise you, I don't think. So I was working on this political campaign of, of a guy named Bill Bowen who was running for city council, the guy whose party I'd been to the night before I went to Selma. And I met this guy, and I convinced him that we should drive all night to Montgomery. My friend Bill and his cousin were, were going to be driving to Montgomery, but I knew and they knew that they didn't want me in the car. And actually, we followed them to the uh, to, to Montgomery, stopped for gas when they stopped for gas. And um, we parked on the front yard of a, of a guy who was near the St. Jude's Hospital in Montgomery, where the night before there had been a fabulous show in honor of the marchers who were there. And um, we, we went, now, in the Selma March, there, there were, on the site, there was a road, and there was road over there, and there were guys with the walkie-talkies here. And occasionally they would say, heads up, and we were to have our heads up because people were throwing rocks off the hill on the other side of the road. Although, of course, you didn't want to put your head up because if they were throwing rocks, you would get hit, but that was what they said, and we were, we were looking for rocks. I never saw any, but they were there. Um, but in Montgomery, when we walked to Montgomery, we were in the road, and the sidewalk was right there. And there were lots of people on the sidewalk saying not nice things to us. And I did see my friend Bill's cousin clench his fists. And that worried me a little bit, but, but um, he calmed himself down, and we kept walking. We were far enough away that we couldn't see the speeches. We, we could barely hear the speeches, but we were there, and that was what I went for. I didn't go to hear the speeches. And um, at the end of the march, everybody dispersed. It wasn't orderly at all. And that also was dangerous. But one, one more thing that I remember clearly is we, we, we did find our way back to the place where we parked our cars. and. Bill and his, his cousin were already gone. And the elderly gentleman on whose front yard we were parked, it was mud, but it was his front yard, um, came out and gave us some money. I don't know if it was a five or a ten. It was a lot of money in those days. But apparently Bill knew that we had decided at the last minute to come. And he didn't know if we had any money. So he gave, he trusted this man to give us this money. <coughs> and the man was so trustworthy, he gave it to us. And it, and it was really exciting for me to have my black friend give money to a black man to give to his white friends in case they needed money to get home. So that was, that was of course, on the radio in the car, we learned that there had been a shooting and that, that one of the demonstrators had been, been uh, killed. But, but John, Professor Enten can talk about that later. Because he's written about it. And actually, uh, Dan can talk about it because he was there and was involved in that fall. So let me cast things on. Thank you. Thanks, John and Diane. That was
pretty accurate, Diane, everything you uh, talked about. Well, we'll wait and see how accurate you are. <laughs> uh, as John mentioned, uh, as, uh, I graduated from our law school here and following the graduation went into the FBI. Uh, and at the time uh, of all of this happening, uh, uh, my wife and I, Carol and I, uh, were living in Jacksonville, Florida. Uh, and uh, the, the, the South was uh, a real hotbed for a lot of civil rights activity. Uh, that summer before was a summer when the uh, uh, civil rights workers were killed over in Mississippi. Uh, and there were a variety of different demonstrations and marches and things going on, and the FBI had intentionally built up the staff uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the southern uh, offices. Uh, my, uh, actually just in part uh, uh, for one minute uh, from uh, my, the FBI story, uh, but my first experience with what was going on down in the south uh, as somewhat related to what Diane was talking about. Uh, I was in a wedding uh, the summer uh, between my uh, undergraduate uh, uh, schooling and law school. And the wedding was down in Spartanburg, South Carolina. I flew, I flew from here in uh, Charlotte. Uh, took a Greyhound bus over to Spartanburg. Uh, I guess when I walked, got on the bus, I noticed that there was a white line drawn across the aisle about halfway back. Uh, but uh, I ignored it. I was not conscious that I should not go beyond that white line, uh, but I did go beyond the white line, but then realized I was in a place where I should be when all of these heads look around the aisle at what is this guy doing, this white person doing behind the white line, because that was the area that was reserved for all of the uh, blacks. Uh, so I stayed there about halfway over to Spartanburg. We stopped at a, a roadside uh, uh, diner, uh, and uh, the whites on the bus all went in the front door uh, and were served, and the blacks all went around to the back of the, uh, the uh, uh, place, and after the whites were served, all the blacks were served uh, out the back door. So that was... Uh, you know, having grown up in the north and worked with uh, uh, blacks in my summers, it was a real eye-opening experience for me. But anyways, fast forward to, to uh, five years later, uh, when we were living down in Jacksonville, and I still remember the uh, Sunday afternoon when we were watching uh, March the uh, 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 7th, uh, when we were watching uh, television, and the afternoon program was interrupted by this uh, uh, major news announcement. And what they showed was the beating that took place uh, as the marchers were going across the Edmund Pettus Bridge uh, in Selma. Uh, and I mean a real beating. These marchers uh, just got onto the other side of the bridge, which we didn't show the whole, uh, that whole episode in the, uh, the uh, movie, in the film there, the, the video. Uh, but as soon as they got to the other side, uh, to the posse on their on horseback, uh, uh, law enforcement officers, highway patrol, state police from Alabama, uh, when they refused to turn around and go back over the bridge back into Selma and continued walking, and that's when they let loose. And uh, I mean, they were just beaten, beaten, beaten. And it was hard to believe that this was taking place, you know, in our country. Uh, two weeks later, uh, I'm out uh, uh, doing my, whatever my FBI work was at that time, uh, but said, uh, come back because you're going to be leaving uh, tomorrow morning, Saturday morning for uh, Selma, uh, for uh, the second march. Uh, the second march was under a federal court order. John, you can jump into this uh, at any time. Uh, and uh, uh, as Diane mentioned, the uh, protection was being provided by the Alabama National Guard as well as by the U.S. Marshals. Uh, the FBI uh, was there to monitor uh, any possible civil rights violations during the march itself. I, I, I'd like to take this opportunity to explain what monitor means. It means that all those white guys in the FBI were there in their dark suits and their white shirts and their dark ties 
taking notes. <laughs> and pictures. And pictures. Uh, Thank you. Thank you for clarifying that. But, uh, and of course, uh, we're going up there. We probably had about 50 agents uh, uh, in Selma at that time uh, coming from different offices uh, in the south. I think there might have been five, uh, five uh, plus from the Jacksonville office that uh, went up there. And, you know, we really didn't know what to expect to, to uh, what was going to happen because, of course, you know, we were all familiar with what happened two weeks earlier at the end of that march. Uh, and, you know, just knowing how the Klan operated and how law enforcement operated in the South, uh, we just weren't sure how safe we were going to be uh, uh, either. Uh, but anyways, uh, on the Sunday then, the uh, uh, march began with the, the numbers that Diane had uh, talked about. Uh, successfully going across the bridge. Uh, the, what they did with the FBI, we were divided into two 12-hour shifts. Uh, there was a shift that worked during the daylight hours, and then there was a shift that was assigned to the night uh, nighttime. I was assigned to the daylight uh, uh, part of the shift. So, uh, likewise, I was assigned on the first day of the shift to stay in Selma, uh, watching them go up to the bridge and across the bridge, just watching for anything that might happen in the town of Selma. Uh, itself. Uh, the first day, uh, the marchers went across the bridge, got out to their first campsite, and as again, as Diane mentioned, there were campsites set up about every 10 miles of the march where they would stay overnight. Uh, got out to the first campsite, and then the marchers dispersed, but some did return to Selma, and they brought them back on a train. And I guess the only time when there might have been some fear that I had was when uh, my assignment then was to go down and sit at the train station and observe. Uh, well, uh, the train station was in this very dark, uh, desolate, uh, deserted area of town, and the thought that was going through my mind is, okay, if, if uh, uh, these, quote, bad guys uh, know they're coming back, and they, they know they're going to be dropped off in this area of town. If they wanted to do anything, they're going to do it on the first night of the march. Uh, because, again, you could, under, you know, uh, uh, under darkness, you could uh, attack and get out of there uh, without anybody really seeing it. But fortunately, nothing happened. And the march continued for the next uh, three or four days. Uh, it was 54 uh, miles. 50, 50, 50 to 54 miles into uh, Montgomery. We did not, the FBI agents uh, were assigned to the march, to follow the march in cars. We were not out uh, with the marchers. Uh, there's a photograph of myself sitting in a car here uh, during, at some point uh, during the march. And uh, except for a few incidents of uh, stone throwing and name calling and that type of stuff, there wasn't any real interference uh, with the march. Nor was there any interference with the march at nighttime. We had a team of agents that also stayed on their, the nighttime shift. They were assigned to wherever the campsite was and they stayed there uh, uh, overnight. So the last day of the march, uh, the uh, marchers had stayed overnight at uh, St. Jude's Hospital. Uh, they, the, the estimates were around 12, 10, 15, 25,000 uh, going into on the last day because then a number did come back into town, as Diane did, uh, to be on the last day of the march. And, and, and lots of other people came down too. Yeah, that, that we were not even there on the first right. day. Uh, because seeing what you know was happening, this was this was front page headline news uh, around the United States and probably uh, beyond uh, at that time. Uh, I was assigned to the public safety building. To we were right next to the state capitol. We were in a vantage point where we could look out over the whole group of marchers that were out there, uh, probably not hearing what was going on either uh, from our our site. But again. Uh, nothing happened at, at that point, uh, and uh, everybody dispersed. And again, we had gotten reports that uh, there was name calling as people were going back to their cars and that type of thing, but nothing, uh, nothing happened. Uh, we returned to Selma, and actually we returned to uh, Craig Air Force Base. It was a uh, 
uh, Air Force training base that was just outside of town uh, and uh, kind of celebrating that uh, we thought we were all going to be heading back home because we were just going up to Selma for the march and then returning to our, our homes. And while we were there, uh, we got notification that, that there had been a shooting uh, on the roads uh, uh, that the marchers had uh, been on between uh, uh, Selma and Montgomery, uh, that the Bureau was being called in to uh, lead the investigation on it, uh, that we were re to return to our uh, uh, hotels where, where we were staying, and that the next morning we were to meet in the federal courthouse for our assignments. Uh, what had happened was uh, the, uh, there had been uh, the uh, uh, people transporting marchers uh, back to, and probably the original group of marchers, back to Brown's Chapel in Selma to get their belongings and maybe even get their vehicles and so forth. Uh, and there was just this group that was continuing to bring people back and then go back to uh, the site in Montgomery and transport more of the marchers uh, back. Uh, and in this one car uh, that was doing this, uh, there was a young uh, black male and a relatively young uh, white woman uh, from Detroit. Uh, had four or five children, I think, and was in her early 30s, uh, Viola Bayuso. Uh, and I'm looking at Professor Ent because as Diane mentioned, he had, John has written about uh, uh, this and about Viola Bayuso. Uh, and uh, there was also cruising the streets of Selma uh, a car for Klansmen from uh, Birmingham who had been over in Montgomery at the march but came back to see what was going on back in uh, Selma. They lived in Birmingham. They worked at Republic Steel uh, in Birmingham. So they happened to see this car with the black male and the white woman uh, dropping people off and heading back, obviously, back to Montgomery, and they took off following the car. Uh, and uh, at some point, uh, shortly outside of uh, uh, Selma, uh, in a very dark area uh, of road, they pulled up alongside the car uh, and they opened fire. Uh, all of them had weapons, and they were all firing into the car except for one of them. There were four in the car, three of them were firing, another one had a gun out as if he was firing, but was not firing. Uh, that person was an FBI informant. Uh, he it was also a member of the Klan. Uh, when he got back to Birmingham, uh, he called uh, the uh, FBI agents uh, who he had been working with in Birmingham who happened to be a member of my New Agents class in Quantico. Uh, and he said, here's, the plan. here's what happened and here's the plan. Uh, we all work at Republic Steel. Uh, we're all taking our revolvers to work tomorrow morning. And we're going to be disposing of them in the uh, blast furnaces. First they threw all their sh shells out. Oh, I, thank you. Thank you. They, <laughs> a very important aspect. <laughs> After their fire, after the firing, they emptied the revolvers, their revolvers, and threw all of the shells out the window, uh, including uh, the live rounds of ammunition uh, being thrown out the window by the FBI, the FBI informant. Okay, uh, thank you, Diane. You're welcome, man. Uh, the uh, so the next morning, uh, the FBI. Uh, was waiting for each one of them as they left their house. Uh, and as they left their house, uh, they arrested each one. Uh, each one did have a weapon on them, and they seized the weapons uh, of each one who had been arrested. Again, including the informant. Uh, at, I will never forget it, at 12 o'clock noon, uh, President Lyndon Johnson, Attorney General Robert Kennedy and FBI Director uh, Jagger Hoover uh, went on to a national news broadcast uh, announcing that uh, four Klansmen had been arrested uh, who were involved in the shooting of this person from, uh, of the woman, the civil rights worker from uh, uh, Detroit. Uh, the, they 
broke us into teams down in Selma. Uh, and the team that, uh, that I was assigned to uh, was to go out onto the road and find the spent uh, cartridges and the live rounds of ammunition. So uh, we went out and, you know, walked the road at uh, metal detectors. Uh, uh, we were, I think it was four or five days uh, that we were out walking the road. And one thing it demonstrated to me was the, uh, the FBI. You know, a lot could be said about the FBI, but the one thing you can't uh, deny them of is the thoroughness uh, and the determination uh, that they were going to find, or I guess we are going to find, these spent rounds, even though it was like looking for a needle in the haystack. We actually thought, because there were other local law enforcement officers out there with us, including the Alabama State Police, uh, we thought that they had probably already found all of the spent cartridges in live rounds, and they were going to dispose of them themselves, and obviously because of the mentality and the feeling down in the South at that time, you know, we're not going to be turning over to the FBI. Uh, you know, their feeling probably, because probably some, many of them were in the Klan anyways, was that uh, this woman got what she deserved uh, uh, it, because of the circumstance that she was in. But anyways, on the fifth day, uh, it was, at, at that time, uh, it was probably uh, almost around the first of April, uh, they had already mowed the grass, it was a bright sunny day, uh, and as we're walking along, uh, there we find laying right on top of the mowed grass, this piece of gold, a spent cartridge, a cartridge. Uh, because we knew as soon as we found one, we'd probably find them all. Uh, and that's what happened. So we found the one laying right on top, uh, and uh, within an hour we had uh, recovered all of the other spent rounds including the live rounds of ammunition uh, that uh, the informant had said that he had thrown out. All of the cartridges were later uh, identified at the FBI laboratory as having been uh, come from the guns that were seized uh, when they were all leaving uh, their residences uh, to go to that work, uh, to go to work. So obviously, were very critical and very important in the subsequent trial uh, of the uh, uh, of those uh, uh, three uh, clansmen or four clansmen. Uh, the balance of the time again, we thought, you know, okay, we found we found the rounds of ammunition. We'd be going home. Well, uh, at that time, there were still some other isolated marches uh, that and smaller demonstrations that they said, you know, we should stick around and be monitoring those. Then the entire state was under a federal court order to have all of these voter registration records that Diane referred to photographed. Uh, and so they divided uh, some of us agents up into teams. Uh, and the team that and to, photo, to visit every county seat in Alabama uh, and to photograph voter registration registration records. So the team that I was involved in had like the southern uh, uh, third uh, down uh, from halfway down, <coughs> drawing the line halfway across Alabama and then cutting it in half and then the, the, the segment in that uh, bottom uh, quadrant. Uh, we just went from county seat to county seat photographing voter registration records. So what turned out to be a one week assignment ended up as being a three month assignment uh, up was she home with the new baby? And Carol was sitting at home with two new babies. <laughs> and she's at that time. Okay. Um, Dan, was was that when we real, or you realized that the voter registration records were of different colors? Oh, the voter registration records were of different colors. If uh, the, the voter registration cards are what we were actually photographing. Uh, if you were white, it was a white card. If you were a black person, it was uh, yellow. It was a quote colored card. And uh, I mean, some of those cards that we looked at, I mean, the the black cards were uh, the yellow cards were so legible and so clear. I mean, these were not individuals who were not you know uh, intelligent and competent uh, you know to vote. But on the other hand, 
you know, they quote, fail the literacy test uh, that they were uh, given. Okay. Um, we're running a little bit short of time, so let's open, let's open things up for questions. Well, I'll answer a question that's usually asked of me. I'm usually asked why I got involved in civil rights activities. And I always point to two things. One of them was growing up and figuring out that the Pledge of Allegiance <coughs> to the flag, which we said in our elementary school classrooms, wasn't true. It, it wasn't the land of the free. And the other is my, the Jewish holiday of Passover, where every year I went to a special meal and, and we said we were slaves in the land of Egypt. Now, if it was wrong for me to be a slave in the land of Egypt, it seemed to me that it was wrong for anybody to be a slave anywhere. And although technically uh, blacks in the South weren't slaves, in a democracy, if you don't have or the right to vote, you are pretty much um, not in control of anything. So I started doing little things at home, and this this was one. And I I've been in the South in '64, not in Mississippi, but in the southernmost county of Tennessee, working on the registration. So Selma wasn't my first foray into trouble. Uh, was it just a woman killed in the chart? Yes. The the guy. The the the, the, the young man she was driving with uh, survived because he pretended to have been killed, he played dead, when, when, so that when they went over to check the car, it looked like he was, you know, they'd gotten him too. Um, she was driving the car. Right, she was driving the car. It went down a ditch. Yeah, it? yeah it, it wound up about 50 yards off the road. She's got a question. Yeah. Do you think that, um, like, the attention that the FBI gave to the shooting would have been different if the white woman wasn't there? Yes. <laughs> Was the FBI involved in finding out who killed Jimmy Lee Jackson? Uh, I don't. I don't think so. I don't think so. That's the, the, scene, the, the fact is that it was, you know, it was as a result of, uh, you know, violation of the Federal Civil Rights Act, and it was part of a. I mean, I never thought that, you know, uh, I was really part of a significant part of, you know, uh, of our history uh, when all of this was, uh, was taking place because it did seem that it was just, you know, an ongoing thing. But uh, that really, uh, I think uh, the, the march, the beating, the, the shooting, all brought, you know, because it was absolutely the center, all of that was the center of attention in the United States at that time. Uh, I just reread, uh, when I get ready for this, I read some, some of the books I have done, including I Was on the Prize. But the one that struck me last night, this is Walking with the Wind by John Lewis, who was head at that time of Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. He was also on the board of the students. Southern Christian Leadership Conference, and of course you know, is now an honored congressman from Atlanta. I hope you know that. Um, he said something about that this was really the last time that the movement worked together. Because there were all kinds of splits. The Student Online Courting Committee was having a lot of, was beginning to have conflicts between native southern blacks and northern whites. And the women in SNCC were beginning to realize how poorly they were treated. So there, and, and there was the resentment by SNCC that SCLC used to come into their territory and bring the press and get all the credit for the work that they've been doing for, for years. So um, John does comment that, that that was sort of the last 
big thing. And he also told me that yesterday was his birthday. And the book, I had never noticed that before, but because I was reading it on February 22nd, I said, that's today. <laughs> I hope he's having a party. <laughs> well, there, you know, the other thing is that there were a number of demonstrations and things going on around, the, you know, around the country uh, prior to that. Uh, and, uh, you know, you knew that college students were spending uh, summers down in the South uh, on voter registration drives and that. But it was the summer before when the, uh, when the workers were killed down in Mississippi. Uh, and when it really, it, violence really, you know, became involved. Uh, and I, but I do think that uh, the, because the initial march uh, was maybe 100, uh, 200 people in that, on and March 7th. Yeah, and they were, they come from church, the, the women hit on high heels, mm -hmm. and they were just locals, except they were being led by John Lewis and Rosea Williams from the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, because Dr. King wasn't there that day. He decided, it w he, I guess he was under some pressure from his own church in Atlanta that, it was time he came home and gave a sermon. But he was there on the second march. He yes, he, the yes, second march. yes, no question. But the first march he wasn't there. And as as uh, Jose and John were walking up across the bridge, um, Jose asked John if he could swim. And John said, no, can you? Because they, they actually thought they might get thrown over. And I got to correct one thing Dan said. When they got to the apex of the bridge and saw what was down there, the guy, the, 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 he was an officer in the National Guard, I guess, or some, some kind of officer, told them they had 60 minutes, 60 seconds to, to, one minute to turn around and go back to their homes or their church. And I think Jose you know, asked if we could have a minute to talk with you, and um, McLeod was his name. He had started counting after his sentence. And when he got to 60, he said advance. So they didn't even have time to turn around. They wanted to pray a little bit. You know, these were all serious churchgoers. They wanted to pray a little bit before they left. But, but they advanced, and people on horseback and people running were swinging their clubs. John Lewis was most, the most seriously injured. He had a skull fracture, and he ended up in the hospital for three days. Um, but Jose Williams picked up one little girl who was running. <laughs> she said, put me down, you're not running fast enough. I mean, but as people fell, the horses walked over them, but the troopers just stepped on them and kept hitting. They kept hitting John Lewis after he was down. I do think that I thought that it was going to make a difference. Um, I didn't know how long the difference was going to take, but I, I thought it was going to make a difference. Otherwise, you know, what was I doing there? Let, let me just pick up one more just to on this. Uh, Dan, Dan mentioned that the, war, the second march took place as a result of a federal court order that the march was being protected. One of the people who was involved in getting that order was our alum, Fred Gray. Um, and, um, he was involved in virtually everything in, uh, related to civil rights. After he graduated. After he graduated. I mean, he represented Rosa Parks when she got arrested on the bus, and Dr. King when the boycott started, and lots of things. But, but you know, if you ask him when they started planning for the boycott, did they think they were going to make history, he'll tell you, no, we were just doing what we had to do. And I think that in many ways, that's the way a lot of this stuff, that people thought they might make a difference, but they weren't thinking, are they going to change the world? They were just trying to make their lives better. One other thing about Fred Gray, there was a time in the history of this country when the, court, so the Supreme Court had ruled that if you couldn't go to law school in your state, your state had to pay your tuition to a comparable, a comparable law school someplace else. So Fred Gray here came here. Um, on the, on the... Well, that, that's actually not quite the most sad. The court said that they couldn't do that. They had, to, they had to provide the education at home, but Fred decided he didn't want to fight that battle, even though it was an easy win. And just for what it's worth, uh, 
I think that he's going to be here giving a lecture in fall. We don't have the date yet, but we can talk more about that when he's here. Um, Kevin, did you have a question? Well, I, I was just going to ask about what uh, kind of a similar tone of work from the FBI's perspective. While you guys were on the ground, were you like saying to yourselves, I've never seen something like this before, especially at night, you know, seeing all these people camp along the road? I, you know, it was all new to us. Uh, because, uh, and we just happened to be, you know, the team that was assigned there. There were other agents at other marches and demonstrations and other things that were going on. Uh, and were we trained for that? Uh, no. Uh, because it, it all came about so, uh, you know, so quickly and so stuff. Okay. There, I, a lot of you have classes. There is a class in year 115, so I think we need to call the formal discussion to the hall. There is a And thanks to the Center for Social Justice and to Balsa for co-sponsoring. Yeah.